This video is brought to you by Sporlin. Quality, integrity, and tradition. Well, happy Saturday. It's Saturday, September 16th, and uh, we have a service call on the walk-in cooler not working. 46 degrees, and uh, there's ice in there. It's hard for you to see, but it's all iced up on the back of the coil. And uh, I had them clear out their food, and while they were clearing out the food, I turned around and uh, this door wasn't open, but I saw that their walk-in cooler was at 30 plus degrees. And there's ice all on this coil too inside. It's kind of hard to see because I just threw it into a defrost, but they're clearly, the defrost taking care of it, but they're clearly leaving a door open. So something's going on here. We're going to get them both defrosted. When I defrost evaporators, I'm a firm believer of just taking all the fan motors, fan blades, fan guards off using hot water and just melting it. And I try to control the hot water so it doesn't overflow the drain pan, go slow, the least amount of mess possible. But I still had them remove all the food just to be safe. Um, and I find it to be more efficient. If you don't do it that way, that's fine to each their own. It's just, to me, it's less destructive, it's faster, and just knocks it out of the park. So I'm still working at it. The drain's draining very well, so that's good. But there's it's solid all the way through. But I wanna point something out. Let's. This kind of got a little wet from my hose, okay? So let's look over here. So what we have here is a little bit of frost, but then underneath it is solid ice. And it seems to be thinner at the top, thicker at the bottom. To me, what that means is that they have a temperature controller right here that has self defrost, okay? It goes into defrost every six hours or something like that, four hours for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, somewhere along those lines. But it's not enough defrost. This hard ice to me means that it's been trying to defrost, okay? And it slowly drips off the coil, but then it refreezes and it gets thicker at the bottom. If it was just frost all the way through, uh, that would be something that was new, but this is hard ice. This has been going on for a week, two, maybe three, and it's been slowly building until there's enough ice that it just completely, you know, eliminates the amount of cooling that this system is, can effectively do. So hard ice that's glossy, shiny. Again, right here is kind of because it's melting, but once you get past this little bit of frost right here, it's just a hard, solid, thinner at the top, thicker at the bottom. That's a sign of not enough defrost. Now it doesn't necessarily mean there's anything wrong with that controller. It to me means that they're leaving the door open. It's frosting up and it's trying to defrost itself, but we'll find out more once we turn it on. This is the walk-in cooler condenser. Just came up here. Don't see anything crazy. I'm waiting for that evaporator to drain. Came over to the walk-in freezer condenser and it had just come out of defrost, but there's still a little bit of ice on the coil. So I pulled the X terminal off. Um, put it back into a long defrost and I'm gonna let it sit in the defrost while I'm working on the walk-in cooler So it's just gonna get really really warm in that walk-in freezer try to melt that ice Also, I melt all the ice from this side. I'm not getting on the other side at all. I'm not trying to make a mess Okay Steam makes it all fall off the ice thawed and what didn't thaw just fell off as big chunks So I'll put it in the drain pan let it melt and then just move on to this side. So I'm not even getting to the back at all. The only thing I'm gonna to go to the back to do is to make sure the coil's not plugged up with dirt and lint. The back of this coil is a little bit dirty, not too bad. So I'm currently spraying some of the Viper aerosol foam cleaner. I'm being careful that there's nothing over there, no food or anything like that. I had to move it all. But it does a really good job of spraying a pretty long distance too. And it does a good job of getting in the coil and actually pulling stuff out. So I'm going to uh, spray from the other side too, because I can, but if you couldn't, it does a really good job of getting in there. How does it pull dirt out? That trips me out. I'm sure John, I should probably ask you, John, John Passarella, the inventor, I should probably ask him, but it's a trip. Like you would think that it's counterproductive to pull dirt out. Usually it pushes dirt out, you know, spray from the inside out, but this stuff does a great job. It's a trip. All right, it is back and running. The evaporator says 47 degrees. My thermometer says about 46. I'm not too worried about that. That's pretty good. Um, Got to get up here and see what the temperature set point is. Temp set point is 36. That's a hair on the cold side because these things go to the bottom of 36. So 35.9. Let's see what the differential is. Three. Yeah, we'll leave that there. Okay. Let's see how many defrost this guy does. Defrost time is 15 minutes. We're gonna change it to 20 minutes. 
defrost per day. We're gonna change it to eight because they're clearly icing it up. Compressor starts per hour, that should be a off. I don't know why that's on. I'm almost wondering if this controller is going bad because I never leave compressor starts on. Yeah, that really makes me wonder about that controller. I'm definitely gonna be coming back. I'm gonna go upstairs and make sure we have a clear sight glass and we're gonna make sure we drop significantly in temp. We're at 45, 46, somewhere in there now. If we come over here, this roof is a mess. This guy's running. Sight glass is clear. It's got a big sporlin seal. Sight glass is clear. I'm gonna give it a few minutes. Nice cold suction line coming back. I'm definitely gonna be coming back to go through the system, but I can't really check any system vitals like superheat and stuff um, until we see the box satisfy. And it's been a while since it's been warm, judging by the ice. So it's gonna take a long time to come down to temp. I've also got an exhaust fan down at another restaurant, so we're gonna be coming back. As long as the temp's doing okay, I'll call them a little bit later. We'll uh, we'll come back when we're not on overtime because it's Saturday right now. This guy right here, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, hook the defrost termination back up and then turn it back on. Let's go ahead and hit this right here. Turned off power. Defrost termination, this is the X terminal right there. If I plug that back in and turn it on, it clicks right out of defrost because it's really warm in the coil. And I'll go ahead and eliminate that really long defrost. And uh, we'll leave it at four defrosts a day. And we'll follow up on this guy too. As far as the time, it's 2.07. I had adjusted it, but it wasn't, it was kind of off. There you go. Somewhere in there. So we'll definitely be following up on this one too. Out of curiosity, what's the condenser coil looks clean. No problems there. Okay, well we're going to watch that one come down to temp significantly and this one come down to temp and then I'll be getting out of here. All right, we are back today. Uh, it's been about a week since I was last here. Doesn't look like there's any ice on the coil. We're gonna verify that the temp control still has the right settings in it. And we actually got some new hinges because they've got these walk-in doors. They've got multiple doors and uh, the hinges are all jacked up. See that door staying open because it won't shut by itself. They don't use them as like walk-through doors. They just use them to grab crap from the shelf. So. We're gonna get those done too. Up at the condensing unit, I've got uh, probes down at the evaporator. We're running a little bit high on the superheat, about 16 degrees evaporator superheat. So we may make an adjustment and get that to drop down. We'd like to see eight to 10, but you know what, it's pumping down. No, I think it was pumping down. So I'm gonna give it another cycle, let it come on, and then see if it starts to, uh, to do that same thing again. Uh, because when it first turned on, it was right at about 10 degrees. Um, so we'll see, but I'll watch it again. Came back into the box. It just has been running for a minute and we're running just a hair on the high side. So I might make one quarter turn and kind of see what that does. I'm watching this thing and I come up here and this TXV, it's pumping down right now, but it's making a loud hissing sound. So before I try to adjust superheat, we're gonna do a quick pump down and we're gonna pop that strainer out and make sure that that strainer is clear because something's clearly going on. A TXV shouldn't be that loud. It got me thinking, normally I'm not concerned about contaminations in my systems, but we did just have a compressor failure on this a couple months back. So it's possible that something is floating through the system. Um, we do have a liquid line filter dryer obviously, but you know, there could be some sort of contamination in there. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna pump it down. I got the king valve right here. We're gonna make sure that this is on tight. Okay, and then I already loosened the packing, this top piece right here. Okay, now that I loosen that, we're gonna front seat this. Loosening the packing helps to save the life. When you loosen it though, it does leak, so be cautious about that. So, close this down. Now it's not calling at the moment, but it will be soon. Now, when you loosen the packing, it does leak, so we're gonna close that right there, so it doesn't leak on us. And then what we will do is we're gonna wait for it to call. Once it calls, 
suction pressure will come up, actuate the low pressure control, and then I'll just hold the contactor in. It does have a time delay, but I'll just hold it in until I get to the pump down level that I want, and then uh, we'll go downstairs. We're, ju we're just gonna do a hot swap. We're not gonna pump it down and open that system to atmosphere. So I'm just gonna pump it down to a low enough level that I can just change out that uh, strainer real quick. Verify that it's clean before I try adjusting on the valve. All right, it turned on on its own. So now I'm just watching the low pressure and it should start pumping down really quick because the king valve is closed on the receiver. So as the refrigerant passes through the liquid line solenoid valve, there we go. We're running low. I'm gonna run it a little bit lower. We gotta be careful because the compressor will bypass if we get too low. Get it to about 10 PSI, see if it'll let me pump it down to there. Now these pressure reliefs in the compressor will jump it back up. So we're at about, oh yeah, see we went up to 27. So I'm gonna go just a little bit lower and see if I can get it to stay lower and then we'll go downstairs. I just shut off the fans because they were bugging me, but it's very possible the hissing sound I was hearing was that booster fan that they're using for their kegs. But I'm still gonna pop this strainer out. Got an extra one right here. It's always good to check these when you can before you try to adjust on the valve anyways. Okay, so there's about 12 PSI in here, so it's a little tricky. You just do it, put your finger over it, and then swap it out. Actually, the strainer is not even dirty, so there's no point. I'll just put it back on and we'll make the adjustments we need to make. So it's always good to check those strainers again because they can be so plugged up. Usually on my systems though, they're not in bad shape. Okay, so I'm gonna torque that guy back on and then we'll finish with our superheat adjustments. Torqued back on, all good. Didn't have to use this one. Always keep these in your truck because sometimes it's just easier to swap them real quick. Um, three quarter and a five eighths. Three quarter goes on the body, five eighths goes on that and you're able to do it real quick. So I'm gonna put this guy together and then we'll make some mild adjustments to the superheat and watch it operate and hope to get it around 10-ish degrees. All right, now what we're gonna do, we know that we need to decrease the superheat. So the easiest way to remember this is if you wanna increase the superheat, the stem goes into the valve. If you wanna decrease it, the stem comes out of the valve, okay? Righty tighty, lefty loosey. So I'm gonna do just maybe quarter turn, right? So there you go, out of the valve, decrease the superheat, we'll see what that does for us. So when you make superheat adjustments, you gotta give it time. You gotta make sure that it has time to stabilize. This one is sitting right around 10 or, 11, or 12 or 11, and uh, I'm just gonna let it sit and go through a couple cycles, just to make sure before I make any more adjustments, we're just gonna let it run. All right, it just turned on again. It's cold. I'm freezing my butt off in here. But it just turned on. We're gonna give it a second to stabilize out. I'm hoping it stabilizes right around 10 degrees evaporator superheat. Currently at 14. Let's give it a second as the valve's kind of finding its happy place. We're just about done changing the hinges. There's a couple that the screws are stripped out. So I've got another tech with me and he's gonna run bolts through the doors. The doors are eventually gonna have to be changed, but these hinges will get them going. And there we go. So it's coming down right now. We'll let it come back up. But I think we're gonna be good. So far, I did basically three quarters of a turn out and uh, we're still kind of stabilizing out but I'm pretty confident that that's going to be good with this guy so let's give it another second and we're stabilizing out right around nine ten ish degrees I'm happy with that so evaporator superheats good we're not icing up anymore we're just about done with the door hinges I think we're going to be good to go that's going to be it on this one we're going to Tell the customer to keep an eye on it. I'm, I'm watching that temp control. I, I don't know if there's anything wrong with it or if someone just got in it and played with it because it did have a weird setting where it did the compressor starts per hour. And I usually shut that off, but we'll keep an eye on that. But other than that, I think that's it. I did increase the defrost on that, I think to eight defrost a day. So I'm happy with that. We're still running. It's right at about 10 degrees evaporator superheat. So again, we're good to go. That's gonna be it. You know, when I get these calls on the weekends, I typically just get them operational as long as it's not like a diary emergency. If it's something easy, I'll finish it. But in this situation, I defrosted the coil. I was a little concerned about the temperature controller because of that, that weird setting in there. But 
I went ahead and came back out. I had ordered new hinges for the other two little doors. They actually have three doors for their walk-in cooler, but two of them are blocked by a shelf and they literally just use them to grab food, kind of like a reach-in cooler. So I went ahead and ordered new hinges and closures for those two doors and because they were sticking open. And then we came back in, went through the box. I did make some superheat adjustments, but I want to stress, you know, you always want to make sure that you're checking if those strainers are plugged up. But I mentioned something in the video. I'm not really too concerned about most of my service calls having um, debris because we do a really good job, or at least we try to do a really good job of keeping contamination out of our systems. We try to pull proper evacuations, making sure that, you know, we're purging our lines and all that good stuff. So we typically don't have plugged up strainers on our equipment unless it's something we recently took over or if we had, you know, some sort of a weird contamination issue. Like I mentioned, we had a failed compressor recently. Um, but the failed compressor was actually just, uh, I think it was like an internal bypass thing or something. If I remember it, I can't remember exactly what happened. I didn't change it. But I went ahead and pumped the system down to slightly positive pressure, what it was like 10, 15 PSI, popped the strainer out, it wasn't dirty. So put it back in, and then I went ahead and made the superheat adjustments on the valve. Now another thing to think about too, it's a good possibility that the power head is starting to fail, okay? And the reason why I say that is this system has been installed for four years, okay? And I know that when we installed it, we checked superheat, right? And then now all of a sudden the superheat's kind of going out of range. So we will definitely monitor the system. It's possible we have a power head that's starting to fail um, because there's no other real reason why we should have to adjust superheat. The spring, the seat, all that stuff in that valve, they don't really go bad, especially on one that's only like four or five years old, okay? So that is something to think about. But went ahead and adjusted it, got it where it should be, went through the operations, didn't see anything else wrong, and all was well, okay? Uh, also, I had someone come out, and uh, while I was there, I defrosted the walk-in freezer the first night, but then or first day, but then I had someone come out the next week, and they went through the box, made sure there was nothing going on with that freezer, too, so all was well on that. I really appreciate you making it to the end of the video. Uh, if you haven't already, please check out my website, hvacrvideos.com. We just got a merch restock, new hats. Uh, well, we have a restock of the large, extra large hats, which we are out of. We restocked a bunch of the large flag t-shirts, the extra large flag t-shirts, uh, the cuffed beanies. We've got a, a whole inventory of those again now. And then of course we still have the flat bill hats, the dad hats, all that stuff available on my website, hvacrvideos.com. If you're interested in supporting the channel, that's a great way to do so. But the easiest way to support this channel is literally just watch the videos from beginning to end. I put these videos out for free, so it really does help when you guys watch them from beginning to end because, you know, obviously I get a little something when you guys watch the videos, YouTube pays me. That's the easiest way, okay? Um, couple other ways to support the channel if you're interested in doing so. Uh, if you go to truetechtools.com, you can use my affiliate code Big Picture on checkout. When you do that, you get an 8% discount on majority of the items they sell, and then I get a small commission from that. Okay, so it saves you money, doesn't cost me any, or doesn't cost you any money, and then I get a little support from that. Um, if you want to support the channel other ways, there's PayPal, Patreon, and YouTube channel memberships. There's links in the show notes of this video. Again, thank you so very much, and uh, we will catch you on the next one.